that they reviewed here on Tuesday, saying that this thing just can't get out, that it, that, it, that uh, there is missing information now, that changes the context of everything. The sources I'm, I'm hearing from are saying, well, it was the FBI that requested those changes. And I'm also told that the, the chairman had the authority uh, to make those, quote, minor technical edits to a document that had already been voted out of committee, which would run contrary, uh, John, to what uh, Adam Schiff, the ranking member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, is saying. But uh, the, the latest information we have, the president expected to declassify this FISA memo and transmit it back to the Hill because they actually own the document tomorrow morning. And from there, they'll take the steps to get it out to the public. John? And when it does come out, it is bound to be the most read document in Washington, right, John? Absolutely. No question about that. Fascinating. John Roberts, our chief White House correspondent. Thank you. Thanks, John. And ahead of the president's remarks at the GOP retreat, he tweeted out, heading to beautiful West Virginia to be with great members of the Republican Party. We'll be planning infrastructure and discussing immigration and DACA. Not easy when we have no support from the Democrats. Not one Dem voted for our tax cut bill. Need more Republicans in 18. Joining me now is Zeke Miller, White House reporter for the Associated Press. Um, Zeke, uh, let me ask you first, I got to ask you about memo gate out of the blocks and the latest that we're hearing that um, it's he, the president is expected to not object to the release. At this point, though, the waters have been so muddied. It seems like nothing's going to sort of clear it up unless people see maybe the underlying material. What's the impression there? I think that's certainly possible, but also highly unlikely. You know, this is, this is certainly a, a memo that will always be uh, politically charged. It has been just given the climate we're in right now. That said, given how sensitive this memo alone is, uh, the, the potential to see any of the un underlying documentation or warrants that were relied on or things like that um, seems next to, uh, next to nil. Certainly that's what Congress is there for. That's what inspectors general are there for. But for the public to see all of that information would be really unprecedented and seems to be unlikely at this point. Has the oomph been taken out of the memo by these charges that it's been edited no matter who edited them? I mean, it seems like the back and forth maybe you know, makes it feel less credible to the public. Uh, I, 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 th that's certainly possible that there is, uh, you know, this is a, but this is a partisan document that was drafted by the committee's majority. There's a minority report that was not, a memo that was not transmitted as well. So this, is, this probably isn't going to change too many minds. You know, Democrats are always going to question the uh, veracity of that memo or, or, or just how faithfully represents what actually occurred because it was prepared by the minority with, uh, by the majority without Democratic input. And right. Republicans are going, to, are going to reject that Democratic concern as partisan. What do you think the tone is at this GOP gathering? I mean, we're watching on one side of the screen here as the president takes off and heads that way. He had, you know, by pretty much all measures, a very successful State of the Union. Then there was the unfortunate train crash, of course, on the way to this meeting. Now there's the tweeting, as we mentioned, you know, about Democrats not helping out. What's the tone like? You know, the turn certainly at, at, at both of his uh, his meetings with Republicans today, both at the Greenbrier when he meets with uh, congressional Republicans, and then later this evening in Washington when he's meeting with uh, the members of the Republican National Committee, is one of concern. Republicans, uh, you know, you know, control uh, majority, uh, you know, majorities in the House uh, and the Senate. They control the White House. They control governorships, and you know, they're going into a midterm year where it's not a favorable climate for them. There's a, a lot of worry both on the agenda for the president this year going forward. How can they position themselves uh, to avoid a wave election? or if it, when it's coming, how to mitigate the damage and maybe retain their majorities there as well. Uh, they're looking for some guidance from the president, but also, you know, they're not looking to see a strategy from the president from, in a, from a political context, but they're looking to see whether it be a legislative uh, standpoint, but also from a communications one, how is the president going to message or the Republican message in 2018 to their membership and then as well to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the public at large? Well, given the reception of the State of the Union, I mean, if you look at polls that were taken by CBS of people who watched the State of the Union, they felt like the president was trying to be bipartisan, that he had extended that olive branch, that he had a lot of good ideas. So he might say to the Democrats, my messaging is great. You guys got to follow up with some legislation. And, and namely, you know, I've proposed a solution for DACA. There's a deal in there somewhere. Both sides want something. Get it done. That, that's certainly possible. We'll, we'll, we'll know exactly what the president says in, in a couple hours, I guess. But, you know, he, he, the, the tone we might see also is one that the vice president, Mike Pence, deployed yesterday when he was in West Virginia attacking Joe Manchin and sort of really, you know, sort of firing the starting gun, so to speak, on, on the 2018 cycle. Um, you know, we could see the president sort of take a whack at, at Democrats even after coming off that bipartisan tone 
Um, and we saw that in the tweets today. That seems to be where his, his, his you know, if the, if, the, if the tweets are any preview of where the speech is going to be, yeah. that seems to be where the president's mindset is today, sort of making a partisan attack rather than one of bipartisanship. Well, it seems like Republicans would be dealing from a position of strength. I mean, they went ahead with the tax cut bill. Democrats weren't on board. And even though it seemed like people didn't like it and didn't believe in it when it was first done, now we're seeing so many announcements from companies um, that the, the tone on it with the public seems to have turned the corner. And for Republicans, they might go back and say, hey, look, Democrats, we did this thing without you. Now it's turning out to be a lot more popular than you thought. Don't you want to get on board with what we do next? Would that work? Uh, that you know, it's certainly possible. That was certainly uh, a bit of what the vice president sort of challenged Joe Manchin to yesterday. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of buying from Democrats on that, on the on the immigration issues. Sort of both parties are so divided right now. We saw that yeah. in the speech and sort of who was standing, who was sitting, who was clapping, and who was not on Tuesday night. So you know, it's possible the Democrats are going to do that. But if they haven't done, come to the table thus far, it seems that uh, you know any legislation this year with the midterms elections yeah. coming up, it will be kind of difficult to go accomplish. No, very true. Zeke Miller, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. A Fox News alert and in a sign of just how caustic things are getting on Capitol Hill over the release of this FISA memo that we are talking so much about. There is a picture of uh, Devin Nunes, the California congressman who chairs the House Intelligence Committee. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi has just sent a letter to the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, demanding that Chairman Nunes step down. Here is part of her letter. She's saying, Congressman Nunes' deliberately dishonest actions make him unfit to serve as chairman and he must be removed immediately from this position. Now, what she's referring to is what John Roberts told you about in his report at the very top of the hour. Five FBI officials went to the White House on Tuesday afternoon. They read over this FISA memo that was prepared by the House Intelligence Committee under the supervision of Chairman Nunes. Those five FBI uh, officials wanted some tweaks, wanted some minor changes, we are told, made to the language of that memo, uh, presumably to protect sources and methods of intelligence gathering. Uh, so the chairman, Chairman Nunes, assented to their, assented to their um, demands, uh, made changes to the memo, and that is what has Nancy Pelosi fired up and demanding that he be removed as chairman. Not going to go anywhere because obviously the Republicans rule the House, but that's, as I said, how caustic things have gotten on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Well, so House Republicans are pushing to release the controversial memo despite those Democrat objections. They're citing surveillance abuse in the Russia investigation. They ought to send a signal to the FBI that, look, you're under the law. I mean, you're not above the law. You can't go out here, have the president of the United States make a decision, and then you decide you're going to fight him in public? Why the FBI says it has grave concerns about releasing the memo. And check out this wild video. An SUV slams into the front of a store on purpose. What these guys Whoa. were trying to get. An SUV plows into a store, thieves crashing through the doors. Look at that. It happened on Monday in England, their target. This ATM, the crooks were able to pull the whole thing out, taking it away. Can you imagine? Police say the suspects are still at large. The Land Rover also stolen. Mm. Wow. To more now on that controversial memo alleging surveillance abuse by the federal government during the presidential election. The FBI already citing issues with the memo's accuracy. Now the president is looking it over. A source tells Fox the president will not object to its release. Now it all comes down to when it will become public. House Republicans already on board saying the public needs to see this. It's going to speak for itself. Uh, and I think that uh, we're going to find out, based on everything we've heard so far, uh, we're going to find some very sobering things about how illegal the practices were during the 2016 campaign. 
Joining me now, Congressman Bob Goodlatte. He is chairman of the Judiciary Committee. I'm not sure if you were able to hear the Fox News alert that uh, we brought you uh, at the end of the last segment, but Nancy Pelosi is demanding that Chairman uh, uh, Nunes be removed from his post because of the edits made to this memo. What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's ridiculous. I think Devin Nunes is a fine chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and uh, I'm not a member of that committee, but my understanding is that the, the, uh, the tweaks that were made were made at the request of Democrats and uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Department of Justice, FBI. So uh, this is, as Newt Gingrich has noted, many of the others have noted, this is a memo. Uh, this is not the source documents, which are classified. Uh, as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I've had an opportunity to examine those source documents. This memo is uh, important to the American people understanding what is going on in the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and I'm glad to hear that the president is getting ready to release it. It's important. So you've seen the source documents. Have you seen the memo itself? Oh, yes, I've read the memo. All right, and, and what are Americans going to take away from it? Well, I'm going to let them take take it away themselves once they uh, see it. It's still classified, and at this point in time, I can't comment on the contents, but I can tell you that it is very serious, very important, uh, and it's important that the American people know this. Uh, this is uh, one aspect of a serious problem and investigation that the Judiciary Committee and the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, chaired by uh, Trey Gowdy, uh, have been working on for several months now regarding the conduct of several people at the highest levels of the FBI regarding the investigation into uh, Hillary Clinton and other activities that were going on last year. And let me emphasize that the FBI is the most important law enforcement organization in the world. There are tens of thousands of men and women who work very hard every day to keep us safe, to fight crime, to prevent terrorist attacks, uh, and they should not be besmirched by what was going on at this high level, uh, and they also should be respected by the Congress and the American people for the hard work that they do. But this cannot be allowed uh, in the headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and I'm pleased that uh, former Deputy Director McCabe has, uh, has now left uh, yeah. the department. Uh, that was long overdue. The, the uh, that does not change the fact that more needs to be done. The presumption is that he will be a central character in this memo. Uh, talking about the FBI, President Trump appointed Christopher Wray to head that agency. Christopher Wray, as head of the FBI, has expressed concerns, maybe even objections, to the release of this memo. Um, does that necessarily, I mean, is he protecting his agency's reputation and turf, or do you think he has legitimate concerns about what, you know, sources and methods that might be revealed as a result of this release? Well, I respect Director Ray, but I disagree with him on this issue, and I don't know what motivates him to take the position he's taking. Again, as has been pointed out, uh, this is a memo from which uh, has uh, uh, the, 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 the sources and uh, uh, other things that would concern you uh, about uh, the underlying classified uh, material uh, has been removed from that, but it allows the American people to understand what's going on. Uh, others will have uh, varying uh, interpretations and opinions of it, but it's important that they know as a starting point to understanding yeah. the investigation that is going on right now with regard to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Very, very quickly, w would you say it's fair to say that it will be embarrassing to the FBI? Uh, it will be embarrassing to several people uh, near the top of the FBI, but uh, that's, that's all I can say at this point. Bob Goodlatte, uh, very interesting stuff, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. That was a good question, a revealing answer, John. That was good stuff, interesting. Well all right. It may explain why the objection uh, yeah, comes to, from the head of the FBI. To several people at the top. That was mm. meaningful. Good stuff. All right. A new directive on where ICE agents can arrest illegal immigrants, what is no longer considered a safe haven, and the controversy surrounding this move. Plus, car rams nearly into a group of people. How a quick-thinking sheriff's deputy saved the day. Fortunately, outcome was good and we got uh, intoxicated persons off the street.
nearly rams into a group of people. Fortunately, Boone County Sheriff's Deputy Charles Schutz saw it coming and pushed everybody out of the way. Schutz was able to chase down that driver and arrest wow. the person for DUI. All this happened wow. about 80 miles northwest of Chicago. Congratulations, Deputy Schutz. And he even chased the guy down. That's amazing. Courthouse is not a safe haven for illegal immigrants. The acting director of ICE now saying agents can go inside courthouses and make arrests, whether it's local, state, or federal court. William Longinesse is in Los Angeles with more on this one. William. Well, Melissa, sanctuary cities and states wanted courthouses to be considered sensitive places, off limits to ICE, like a school or hospital. But the ICE director said, absolutely not. If you're a criminal alien, a serious felon, a gang member, ICE agents will arrest you in court and then deport you. And if agents also encounter other illegal family members in the courthouse, they too can be deported. It's exactly opposite of the type of protection sanctuary cities had intended. What they've done is force my officers to arrest dangerous criminals on their turf in their homes and their place of business rather than arresting them in the safety and security of a county jail. It's ridiculous to, put, to knowingly and intentionally put law enforcement at risk. So previously, ICE agents would take custody of criminal aliens at the jail as they were released until sanctuary cities outlawed the practice. So courthouses where defendants are stripped of any weapons and they can't barricade themselves in a house, well, that's the next best alternative, according to ICE. Now, another concern for Holman, the surge of unaccompanied minors from Central America at the border again. He blames this time a Ninth Circuit Court opinion mandating the release of minors. So parents again are smuggling their kids north who then turn themselves over to the Border Patrol, knowing that most immigration judges will not deport children. Some parents also believe we're told that their kids will get amnesty under DACA. So last year, the Border Patrol apprehended about 80,000 unaccompanied children and family units. Melissa, about a third of all arrests. Well, stats now show a 40% increase over the past three months. Hmm. Back to you. Interesting. Great report. William Longinez, thank you. A congressman who became a household name when he led the Benghazi investigation. Why Trey Gowdy now says he won't be in politics much longer. Plus, President Trump's State of the Union address gets a glowing review from some media outlets. Others not so much in one year on the job. And it might come as a surprise to some that he's lasted so long, given the reported tensions between Secretary Rex Tillerson and President Trump. Doug McElway live at the State Department with a look at that year. Doug. Well, John, one sign that uh, Rex Tillerson remains in very good stead with the President of the United States on his one-year anniversary is that he was with the President of the United States just this morning at the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia, where Republicans are meeting for their retreat. That before he jets off to Austin, Texas for a speech at the University of Texas before flying off to South America and Latin America, where he will be visiting the countries of Mexico, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and Jamaica, and where he will attempt to reassure our allies there who are concerned about uh, Mr. Trump's tough immigration policies and his stance against NAFTA. Yet rumors have never quite died away that there exists some friction between the President of the United States and Mr. Tillerson. These rumors really reached a peak last October, as you'll recall, when it was reported that Secretary of State Tillerson referred to the President of the United States as a moron. He was asked about that. Here's what he had to say at that time. I'm not going to deal with petty stuff like that. I mean, this is this is what I don't understand about Washington. And he, at that same time, went on to reaffirm his intention to stay on as Secretary of State. My commitment to the success of our president and our country is as strong as it was the day I accepted his offer to serve as Secretary of State. But even today, there is remaining widespread speculation that there is some tension between the national security wing of advisors at the White House and the more moderates, uh, the people who are reflected by national security advisor H.R. McMaster, uh, CIA Director Mike Pompeo, and the more moderate wing of cabinet ministers, including Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Mattis. That divide may be reflected in the recent decision to abandon the nomination of Victor Cha as ambassador to South Korea. Cha was reportedly opposed to the administration's hardline approach 
approach to North Korea, including alleged plans for a so-called bloody nose attack uh, strike against North Korea to compel Kim Jong-un to abandon his nuclear program. So, John, the, the reality is that that tension may be there, but supporters of this administration say that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's an indication that the president is getting advice from an array of people, an array of opinions that he's not just hearing from yes men. John, back to you. Yeah, and we should all remember it was uh, predicted, it was told even in Washington, leaked, right, right. Uh, that, uh, that Secretary Tillerson would be out by now. That's yeah. right. Thanks very much, Doug McElway mm -hmm. at the State Our pleasure. The Republican who led the Benghazi investigation is leaving the House. Congressman Trey Gowdy of South Carolina deciding not to run for re-election. The former federal prosecutor says he plans on returning to the justice system. I have to say that of all of the, the defections of, of uh, committee chairman, uh, the decision of somebody like Trey Gowdy, who is uh, you know, a guy of his integrity, of his intelligence, the idea that he's calling it quits, uh, I think really does speak volumes about uh, what a kind of messed up and, and dispiriting place Washington has become. Let's talk about what this, what this means. Um, joining me now is Kevin McCullough, conservative syndicated radio host with Salem Media. Um, and we also have, pardon me here as I, as I go through my notes because we didn't have this up here in the prompter. Guys, can you help me out? Robin Byro. Robin Pure Robin Byro. Us as well. I, I have Robin right here so I can get to you quickly, but I didn't have your title in there. Sorry about that. Robin, I'll start with you. What do you think sure of this? Thing. I mean, do you think it's really about um, everybody being at each other's throats? Hasn't it always been like that? You know, it has, and I really can't stand it. But I was, you know, concerned last month when he announced that he was leaving the House Ethics Committee, uh, citing a, a, his workload. I just didn't buy that story. I thought yeah. there might be something else to this. Uh, I heard rumors that he might have ethics concerns of his own. Uh, so, you know, I was surprised yesterday with this announcement. Um, but I just want to say, I sent in a graphic, and I'm sure I didn't get time to get to the producers. <laughs> but there, there have been three and a half times more Republicans up to top that yeah. have left than have Democrats. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's a concern here, especially headed into the midterms, uh, you know, and, and it, I don't want to use some cheap pot shot, but, you know, my Democrat friends would say it's rats jumping a ship. I don't want to go that low, uh, yeah. but the numbers don't lie. Well, Kevin, what do you think about that? Because, you know, if you think to Mitch McConnell, for example, who told our own Martha McCallum that in his entire time serving, 2017 was the best year ever for him. And that was after a very rough start with the president, obviously, where they were very much at loggerheads. So is this maybe a matter of people wanting, rather than rats jumping ship, people wanting to leave on a high note, that they accomplished something, they got tax reform, and they want to get out? I think with Trey Gowdy in particular, it could be a combination of factors because I think he was one of those very few principled guys that came to Washington with a desire to see certain things happen, uh, kind of part of the Tea Party fusion, and uh, really championed a lot of those causes. Uh, worked a lot of long hours on a lot of unpopular things like Benghazi and uh, even in the Hillary email investigations and so forth. And I think that over time, uh, that Washington does one of two things to you. It co-ops your soul or it, <laughs> or it burns you out. And, uh, and, and you just saw from Robin some of the reasons why. When people say they're not going to punch you in the gut, they're punching you in the gut. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Trey Gowdy getting called names like rats leaving the ship, that kind of thing, that, that's the kind of stuff that he's, he's tired of. And I think as a prosecutor, a talented prosecutor, yeah. he can go back and put bad guys in jail. And I think that's what he likes doing. Well, if you look at sort of the back and forth that speaks to maybe that point that it just gets exhausting, um, you look at Vice President Mike Pence tweeting out to Joe Manchin, voted no to giving working families more of your hard-earned money. Joe voted no on tax cuts. Joe voted no time and again on the policies that West Virginia needs. Joe voted no. And then you see Senator Joe Manchin replying, the VP's comments are exactly why Washington sucks. I mean, that, and this is, you know, right after it seemed, we had a State of the Union, everybody's leaving, you know, it seemed like, and then you get something like this where Joe Manchin responds like that. And, you know, Robin, I don't know, what do you think? 
Uh, you know, I think that he might have got burned out with the ben Benghazi investigation specifically. Uh, you know, they spent $7.8 million uh, chasing that dog and, and never really got anything. Uh, so, you know, I just have to wonder if he just didn't get burned out like my co-panelist here said. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, coming from South Carolina, I reached out to Jamie Harrison, associate director of the DNC, mm -hmm. uh, and his statement was specifically that uh, <clears throat> Trey Gowdy says, claims to be above the the partisan fray, but that he, in fact, was part of the partisan fray because uh, McCarthy admitted that that was a partisan tact to bring down Hillary Clinton. So, mm. and it just didn't work out the way I don't that know he if the wanted. The families of those who died in Benghazi would agree with you, but that's probably beside the point. Kevin, l let me ask you sure. what does it mean? So, if you have a lot of top Republicans who are stepping to the side at this point, is that maybe a draining of the swamp? I mean, even if these are names that people like, it didn't President Trump go to Washington to make change? And this is, after all, change. I think it's a mixed bag. I don't think Trey Gowdy fits the uh, picture of the establishment that everybody was uh, referring to in the draining of the swamp originally. Yeah. I think he's a really principled fighter, and I think that we're going to miss him. He's, he's going to be one of those voices on Capitol Hill that I think always cut through all of the nonsense to get uh, right to the, uh, to the heart of the matter. And when you have, you know, my co-panelists saying that he had questionable ethics problems of his own based on nothing more than a rumor, I can kind of understand and relate to what he's dealing with because it's an unfounded charge. Okay. Robin Pirro, Kevin McCullough, thank you. Thanks to thank both you. of you. Thank you. Thank you. What a crack in a cold...